three, sense and sensibility. Slow and inscrutable, the snail invites the question posed by the haiku. That snail, one long horn, one short, what's on his mind? Tempting though it is for us to be anthropomorphic, the exercise of ascribing human attributes to animals usually tells more about us than about the particular animal we are describing. Continually, writers will project meanings and intentions onto inscrutable, expressionless characters like the snail. In such an attempt to elucidate what's on his mind, the poet Thom Gunn finds that the seemingly purposeful movements of a snail speak of determination and hidden passion. However, while Gunn identifies that the snail is charged by an inner fury, the nature of such fury remains unintelli unintelligible to him. John Banyan likewise saw purpose in the snail's soft motion, but eschewed Gunn's notion of fury at work. Unlike other animals that would rage and glare, Banyan's less aggressive female snail stilly seizes on the flower or herb appointed for her food, making no noise at all. Acknowledging that the snail couldn't travel far, yet could calmly succeed in its pursuit, of survival, Banyan regarded the animal as an example of how quiet determination can win the day. Snails, when they do appear in literature, are often perceived as mystifying, obscure creatures with whom human interaction is impossible. Even when that famed bestial communicator Hugh Lofting's creator, Dr. Doolittle, manages to learn the snail's language and speak to it directly. Any conversation the two have is left unwritten, unrecorded for the reader. The philosopher or poet may speculate about a snail's sense and sensibility, but only occasionally do such judgments accord with actual scientific evidence gained through working with the creature both in nature and in an experimental setting of how it feels to be a snail. Virginia Woolf imagined the world from a snail's point of view to be a mag magnified environment of brown cliffs with deep green lakes in the hollows, flat blade-like trees that waved from root to tip, round boulders of grey stone, vast crumpled surfaces of a thin cracking texture. But does a snail perceive such a landscape? Studies have shown that seeing the outside world through a snail's eye is to perceive a world very different from our own. Indistinct shapes, vague patterns of light and shade, and little else, and all this against a background of silence, for the snail is unable to detect noise. As if to compensate for this, the creature's other senses of touch, taste, and smell appear well developed, and it is largely through these modalities that the animal gains its impressions of the outside world. How the snail organizes and acts upon the information gathered via these senses is still an embryonic science, but thanks to Ronald Chase in Canada, 
and Eric Kandel in the United States, we are beginning to understand some of the underlying mechanisms. The snail has no brain that you and I would recognize, just a system of control centers or ganglia linked together and supplied by nerve fibers from all over its body, as well as conducting electrical impulses. These ganglia also secrete chemicals that control growth and reproduction. The discovery of giant nerve cells, first in freshwater snails and subsequently in Apolicia, a type of marine snail, first led scientists to think about using snails as models for studying the nerves, nervous and chemical control of animal behavior. Apolicia is a snail with a vestigial shell that bears a close external resemblance to a hair. Its common name is sea hare. When disturbed, it releases copi copious amounts of purple ink into the surrounding water, much like a squid. It was believed that Apolicia's fleshy flesh and inky liquid were deleterious to humans. Even touching the snail was thought to render you bold, and the mere sight of one would not fail to subdue the obstinacy of a concealed pregnancy. Eric Kandel, who went on to receive the Nobel Prize in Physiology in 2000, chose Aplicia as his experimental animal because its nerve cells, while being small in number, 20,000 compared to, for example, 100 billion in man, are amongst the largest cells found in the animal kingdom. In such an intri intriguing species, Kandel found an idea, ideal system for exploring the molecular basis of memory storage. He discovered that the new Neural circuits concerned with memory have synaptic connections that change in strength with learning. By studying simple behavioral reflexes in a snail and focusing on where change occurred in a circuitry, in a circuitry he was able to elucidate some of the principles underlying the cellular basis of learning and memory which are present throughout an animal ki the animal kingdom. Aplicia has given us insights at a cellular level as to how a simple nervous system works, but its repertoire of behavior is limited and unlike its cousins, the octopuses and squids, there is no evidence that it can solve simple puzzles or be taught a straightforward task. As far as understanding the processes of reasoning or rather decision making within a snail, a humble garden snail can tell us much more. Alan Cook, who has a particular interest in the behavior of land snails, have made a study of decision making in Helix Aspelsa and has shown how pragmatic they can be. If the weather suddenly becomes cold or dry, an individual snail may choose merely to slow down its movements or enter a phase of dormancy. When dormancy is broken, circumstances dictate whether activity is resumed at once. Oliver Goldsmith put it rather nicely. The snail sleeps until the genial call of spring breaks its slumber and excites its activity.
So great are the numbers of snails that emerge in the spring when conditions are particularly favorable that gardeners were once inclined to think they burst forth from the earth itself. How land snails survive in hostile territories where, where the ambient temperature prohibits other forms of life is only partially understood. Nat Schmidt Nielsen has studied the survival of snails in the Negev desert in Israel by inserting thermal thermocouples into the bodies of snails he was able to show that these animals didn't become as warm as neighboring rocks their temperature remained less than 50 degrees a tolerance limit for any snail their chalky white shells reflect much of the intense solar heat and their bodies retreat into the apex of the shell, leaving air in the largest whorl as insulation. Thus, the snail's experience of the world is heavily influenced by its most marked feature, the shell. The snail's snail shell has provided much inspiration for writers in fiction, being as it is a powerfully evocative image and therefore ripe for metaphor. The novelist Antonia Bayat uses the image of a snail throughout her novel Babel Tower, both through snail references in the text and most intriguingly intriguingly by the use of tiny snail illustration at the beginning of some of the chapters. The central character, Frederica, is attracted to the idea of snails wearing their genetic code for all to read on the spiral of their shells. The bands and growth lines on snail shells act as reminders of past influences. Snails, she tells us, carry a story on their outsides. The idea of the shell reminding us of experience and therefore a path through endurance chimes with scientific findings mentioned above, which demonstrate how crucial the ever-present shell is for the snail's endurance in hostile environments. The shell's protection in enabling the snail to survive also conversely invites questions about the snail's inner vulnerability, which has also excited writers. Bayat herself opens the book with a description of a thrush cracking open a snail shell on rock, thus harnessing the possibility that every snail's protective shell has the potential to crack and become permeable to the dangers of the outside world. The poet Alessandro Galenzi too imagines the vulnerability of a snail beneath its hard yet brittle coiled exterior when he says, it takes the merest trifle to smash in the fragile dwelling and a good round curse transforms the snail to sluggy nakedness. The shell also suggests the idea of a snail's solitude. After all, the snail carries its own house around on its back, thus one might suppose has little need for companionship, instead seeking out lonely resting sites. Scientists have found that such homing activity is further evidence of the snail's curiously self-sufficient form of pragmatism. As Ronald Chase points out, 
snails return to their homes late at night to avoid desiccating desiccation and for reasons of safety. The availability of another suitable resting site can be shown to influence the decision of an individual snail to stay out or to proceed homeward. Homing, sometimes something that relies on chemical cues, can be prevented by removing the snail's cephalic tentacles, those protrusions from the head that have at their tip, smell sensors, and a primitive eye. Removing both tentacles results in their regrowth. Merely removing one has a disorientation, disorienting, disorientating effect on the animal. In a frequently quoted passage from the Descent of Man, 1871, Charles Darwin reports an example of how snails follow trails, from which he draws his own optimistic conclusion on the companionship of snails. An accurate observer, Mr. Lonsdale, informs me that he placed a pair of land snails, Helix pomatia, one of which was weekly, into a small and ill-provided garden. After a short time, the strong and healthy individual disappeared and was traced by its track of slime over a wall into a, an adjoining well-stocked garden. Mr. Lonsdale concluded that it had deserted its sickly mate. But after an absence of 24 hours, it returned and apparently communicated the result of its successful exploration. For both then started along the same track and disappeared over the wall. Darwin concluded that this was evidence of attachment between snails. Sadly, it isn't. While it used to be thought that snails orient themselves by following the slime traits of other snails, it has been shown, at least in the periwinkle, that following an existing trail is primarily an energy-saving device rather than a sign of companionship. Less mucus is needed to move forward if a trail has already been laid down and more energy is therefore conserved for the important tasks of feeding and mating. The fresher the slime, the easier it is for the snail to proceed. There is no evidence of pair bonding in snails and as for communicating the benefits of a well-stocked garden, as Darwin supposes, there is little proof of that sort of interaction either. Snails, for its most part, remain solitary creatures, motivated by the same desires that drive other animals, namely food, shelter, and reproduction. The poet William Cooper noted this content disregard for companionship observing in a snail.